Please be opening your Bibles to the New Testament in the book of Hebrews. Book of Hebrews chapter 2, and we'll get started there in verse 1 in just a moment. I mentioned some time ago that I want to try to go over the very first principles and fundamentals of a number of things regarding the Christian faith. And so I want to continue that this morning by noticing how men disobey God. Now I think the passage also tells us why they disobey God, but we'll let that stand as another study. But this morning I would like to zero in on how men disobey God. So now let's go to the second chapter of Hebrews and we will begin with verse 1. Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense or reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto them that heard him? God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. There's a phrase in this passage that gives us the subject of the morning concerning how men disobey God. And it reads, every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. I think you will see in that a how and a why, and we'll zero in on the how men disobey God. This test states that in time past, during the time of the Old Testament and the law of Moses for the Jews in particular, we could call it the Old Testament age that you'd like or the Mosaic dispensation. He says every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. It then asks, how shall we, Christians, members of the Lord's church, how shall we escape? Then he says, if we, and we pause right there. Because the Old Testament benefits us who are under the authority of Christ and the words of the New Testament in a great many ways. One of them, it gives us patterns or examples of obedience and disobedience. So it teaches us by example. Or as Paul said, Romans 15, 4, these things written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. The things written in the Old Testament then were written for our learning. Thus they instruct us, us who? Those of us under the authority of Christ in the words of the New Testament. Remember Jesus said in John 14, 6 that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And in Matthew 28, 18, in giving Matthew's account of the Great Commission, he said, All power or authority hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. And here we're able to see just how the Old Testament is joined together with the New Testament to make a divine pattern. When people rise up and say, you people of the Church of Christ don't believe in the Old Testament, they're just simply not stating what is true. Now by that I mean for those who are properly informed in the right division of the Word of God, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15. Now we do not submit to the authority of Moses under the law of Moses. But Paul, in writing part of the New Testament of Christ, which is where he expresses his authority as the only one who can uh, lead us to heaven, makes it clear that there's great benefit in knowing properly the Old Testament. Thus, we noted Romans 15, 4. So it's true that we're not under the Old Testament as the authority for becoming a Christian and living the Christian life as a law, if you please, a body of law to govern us. But the Old Testament examples establish 
principles that do not change and that help us in learning the importance of submitting to the perfect law of liberty, which the New Testament is, James 1, verse 25. Laws change as God unfolds the scheme of redemption down through the years from the beginning until the first century. Ordinances change. Covenants change. But listen, the pattern for obedience does not change. The word obedience presupposes law or commands or a system of authority that governs people from a source not within man himself. A source outside of man. An objective standard that applies to anybody, male and female, rich, poor, whatever. Therefore, obedience is a state of subjection to authority. The submission to rule. The acceptance of guidance, in this case, from God concerning how to become a Christian. Exactly at what point Christ remits one's sins. And in living the Christian life. So this principle is true whether we're speaking of civil law or criminal law. Or in the case of the Bible, divine law concerning spiritual matters. Whenever anyone refuses to comply then with law in general. That's simply disobedience. Whether it's civil or criminal or divine law. When people try to say that we're under a system of grace and not under law, they completely abuse and misuse and contradict such books as the book of Romans and the book of Hebrews and Galatians. They don't understand the unfolding of the scheme of redemption down through the history of man. And therefore they don't understand at what time parts of the divine volume was for those people at that time, and yet that would cease. You hear it in the first couple of verses of the first chapter of Hebrews, when he said, God who at sundry times and divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. So whenever anyone resists what is right, whether it's a Jew under the law of Moses violating right as the law of Moses designated that right, or even under the patriarchal age, or under the authority of Christ and the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25. Whenever anyone resists what is right in either the moral realm or the religious realm, then he is in a state of disobedience, and that's sin, and that means you're separated from God and thus lost. Now how men disobey God can be summed up I believe, in several words, which really define man's relation to God and describe his whole attitude or mindset toward God and the religion of God. So, as I said, I want to look further into this business of how men disobey God. I want you to look, first of all, at the uh, prohibition, the word prohibition. Man disobey God when he violates or he uh, uh, violates a prohibition. Uh, he violates a thou shalt not, if you please. An example of this is seen in the very beginning of the Bible. In Genesis, and the book means origins. When you see Genesis, you're seeing the origin of everything. And here's his first act of disobedience. Both Adam and Eve transgressed and disobeyed God. That's found in Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. There they are, sinless in the Garden of Eden. And they're told that you cannot partake of the tree in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The devil came and persuaded Eve, and she partook of it, and gave it to her husband. He did eat. Now they transgressed God's will. They have violated a prohibition. Now that seems rather clear to me that that's one of the ways and how that one can violate God's will, sin. And thus they were separated from God and began physically 
to die, and immediately they were separated from God in a spiritual manner. Listen to how the writer of Romans, Paul, uh, wrote about this and what he had to say. I think it to be as clear as it can be, and he's using it even as we are now in explaining in the New Testament this matter. Now notice, wherefore as by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So there's the word prohibition. You simply violate a thou shalt not. You do what you're told not to do. Then there's another word. Omission. Omission. In Genesis chapter 4, we have the record of the first sin of omission. It's the disobedient act of Abel's brother Cain. He omitted what God authorized or commanded him to do. Genesis 4, 3 through 5. He offered that which he had no Bible authority to offer. As we would say today, no authority from God to offer. If you go to the New Testament, same Holy Spirit inspired all the writers of the Bible. So God actually wrote the Bible regardless of the human hand that set it down. In the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 4, he says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. By faith he acted. And I might point out in passing that you'll notice that every one of those passages in Hebrews 11 that says by faith also has after that they did something. They acted. Thus again tying in with James 2 on the faith apart from works is dead. Thus their confidence in God, their trust in God was based upon the revelation of God's word to them that they understood. And thus their faith acted in obedience to whatever it was God required them to do. So if faith comes by hearing the word of God, and it does, Romans chapter 10 verse 17, and Abel offered unto God his sacrifice by faith, then it stands to reason that Abel offered his sacrifice on the basis of the word of God for his day concerning that sacrifice, and Cain did not. Thus we have examples in the New Testament showing us how we as Christians benefit from the Old Testament. And here's the Holy Spirit showing us how to study the Old Testament. The word of God is necessary to perform an act of faith. Because faith comes by hearing the Word of God. That's the reason that we should be able to say and should know the importance of saying it. That what I believe, using the word believe or belief or faith as it's used and defined in the New Testament or the Bible. We should always be able to say, here's what the Bible teaches, it, either explicitly or implicitly. You see, it's by faith I can say that Saul of Tarsus in the process of becoming a Christian repented of his sins. Yet in just so many words, you cannot find that anywhere in the Bible, especially the New Testament. But I can say that by faith. Because the New Testament teaches that anybody who becomes a Christian must not only believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And do that on the basis of the evidence contained in the Word of God that proves that he is deity in the flesh. But also that person is commanded having believed in Christ to repent of his sins. Acts chapter 17 verse 30. And then to confess one's faith in Christ as the Son of God. And then to complete his obedience to the plan of salvation by being immersed in water by the authority of Jesus Christ. Into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission or forgiveness of sins. Now since that's taught in the totality of the New Testament's teaching on how to be saved and at what points one is saved from sin. And I know that Saul of Tarsus became a Christian then without the New Testament explicitly saying it, that is saying it in just so many words, I know it's a matter of faith that Saul of Tarsus repented of his sins. But we should not, speaking as the oracles of God, which we are commanded to do, we should not at all say, well, I believe thus and so, when we have no idea at all that the Word of God teaches it. What we ought to say is, I guess, if we're going to say anything, <laughs> I think it. Now, I know in modern day English, belief means I think sometimes. But speaking as oracle, oracles of God, and faith comes by hearing the word of God, then my faith in God must be predicated solely and only on what the Bible teaches. 
God commanded, He authorized in that day, long ago in the beginning of things, in their sacrifices, an unblemished lamb for the offering. How do I know that? It does not explicitly say God commanded Cain and Abel to offer an unblemished lamb. You can't find it in those words. But I do find what Abel offered. And I do find that he, by faith, offered it. And I do find that faith comes by hearing the word of God. Now what does that imply, folks? that the commandment of God for the offering to Cain and Abel was an unblemished lamb. And out of faith, Abel operated, and he's in that great hall of fame chapter on faith as an example to us as to how we operate by faith under the authority of Christ in the perfect law of liberty. So by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Therefore the word of God instructed Abel and Cain to offer a lamb. Cain didn't. He omitted what God admitted. So Cain's disobedience represents a failure to do what is commanded. Disobedience by omission means failure to do then what is commanded. Failing to do what God has commanded may be a matter of negligence or it simply may be some kind of carelessness or it may be an utter disregard for the commandment of the Almighty. But whatever may be the cause, when one omits doing what God has commanded, he has performed an act in his omission of disobedience to God, and he has sinned. Thus, James would write in James chapter 4, the last verse, to him that knoweth to do good. Notice, do good. Do what's authorized. Good is what's authorized. Good is the will of God. To him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not. That's omission. It is sin. And beloved, that's going to catch more people and consign them to torment than probably the first. Because we have been persuaded that, well, I don't curse and I don't lie, blah, blah, blah. Therefore, I'm a good person. I say again, as I have all over the country where I've preached, if I've been there long enough, add up a column of zeros. Tell me what you have at the bottom of it. You have a zero. So when you have ceased to do all those works of the flesh, something must take their place. Now what is it? Doing the will of God and all of its various and sundry directives to us. Now third in the classification of disobedience is the word addition. Addition. Man disobeys God when he adds to that which God commands or authorizes. It's often remarked that the Bible does not say not to do it. And when people come up with that kind of thing, that's because most of the time they've added to the Word of God. <laughs> the tenth chapter of Leviticus is an example of this kind of disobedience. Notice again an example from the Old Testament that teaches us how to respond to any law. Leviticus 10, 1 through 3. And you'll remember that's about the sons of Aaron, priests of God, and Nadab and Abihu. Now what did they do? They offered a fire, or they offered incense on a fire, and the origin of that fire did not come from what God said. It just didn't. It was an act of it adding to what God said, a lack of respect for His law. So they went somewhere else and said this will do just as well. So while there's one source of fire the law said, we'll add another source of fire to it. Now what did God think about that? Not kind of being picky. But he killed both those men, recorded it in the Bible, and said these things are written before time for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Look at what is said in the book of Ezekiel. In chapter 22, verse 26, concerning the priests of that day and had gone on for a long time. And verse 26, I say, Ezekiel 22, 26. And notice that the prophet rebuked the priests of Israel in their failures to do what God said. Verse 26 reads, speaking of what they had done, one of the reasons God destroyed them. Her priests have violated my law. How do they violate his law? How do they transgress his law? 
and have profaned my holy things. How do they profane those holy things? They put no difference between the holy and profane, neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean, and I have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths, and I am profane among them. It's obvious they made no distinctions where God made distinctions. Now what does that tell me as a member of the church who wears the name Christian, which means of Christ, when I know that I am to serve Christ faithfully? It tells me I must make the distinctions that God makes in His authoritative word. And that was true under the law of Moses, under the law of patriarchy, and it's still true today under the perfect law of liberty where Christ manifests His authority as King of kings and Lord of lords over the whole world, but especially to the church because that's His spiritual body. The principle that determines acceptable service to God is whether the thing is done in the appointment of God, or by an appointment of God, by authorization from God, by command of God, by precept of God, or it's an innovation of man. Nothing in the realm of service to God and worship to God is acceptable to God, except that which He's authorized. Now that's why Paul said what he did in that most familiar passage to us, Colossians 3.17. Whatsoever you do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by Him. Now recognize, too, in the right division of the word, this will help us, in other words, in ascertaining God's authority, not reading into it something we like or don't like, or taking away from things something we don't want or doesn't suit us, but simply taking it for what it is, the Word of God, without adding or subtracting from it. Some things, then, as we study the Bible, are morally right, but they are religiously wrong. Back in Jesus' day, you remember that the Pharisees thought they were doing things and people a favor by making all of these laws because they thought that was helping them obey the law of Moses and not transgress it. And it turned around to where they bound their traditions more than they did the law of God. And actually, by binding their traditions more than the law of God upon the people, they set aside the authority of God. It's morally right to, to wash hands. But it's wrong if it's done as a religious act. Mark 7, 1 through 9, verse 13. A person can take a string of beads and they can count those beads all day long. You know, in some places, in, among the Arabs and among the Greeks, they have their worry beads. It's sort of like the fellow sitting there and he's so nervous he doesn't know it and he's just patting his foot and never, you know, he's wearing off that edge. Uh, that's the way you work off the edge, then work it off. I don't know that anything to do with sin. Unless you're going to bind it as a thing that says it's as holy you are. Well, those people over there go through all sorts of counting of beads. They don't do it. As far as I know, the Arabs and the Greeks, when they use their worry beads. But now, if you get over and take a rosary under Catholic doctrine that purports to be God's will and begin to count those be beads as Catholic doctrine says it is, that's a morally right thing just to do it, but it comes wrong when it becomes what? A religious thing to do as a part of being faithful to God and loving God. It's religiously wrong. Morally right, but religiously wrong is a principle that would be well to be anchored in our minds when we study God's Word. It's morally right to play on a mechanical instrument of music when it comes to playing whatever song one might like, all other things in the song being scripturally equal. But it is religiously wrong when you use it in worship to God for there's no authority in the Word of God for it. It's that simple. Now, a lot of people find the truth to be very strange when they've been anchored in everything but the truth all their life, and they have no idea of these particular matters. So a thing that's morally right can become religiously wrong because you use it for the wrong thing. You know, it wasn't wrong even to bring this in to Cain's offering. It wasn't wrong for him to use vegetables, but it became wrong when he said, this is what God authorizes me to do in worship of him in the sacrifice of that day. Now this is what Moses was trying to get over to Aaron regarding Nadab 
and a bayou. He was trying to make that clear. You know, he's forming a nation, a spiritual nation that is a theocracy. They are in the flesh, but God's word governs them. Not only spiritually, but morally and civil law and criminal law. And thus, this is, this is the formation, if you want to call it like we do in America, the founding fathers. They're in the founding of Israel. God's making points with them that they needed to remember if they were to stay what they ought to be all the time that they were there. Now, in Leviticus 10, listen what you've got, and we'll reiterate some things you've already said. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer, and put fire therein, and put incense thereon, and offered strange fire. Strange because not authorized, not the word of God for them, before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord, and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Now listen. Then Moses said unto Aaron, this is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come near to me, and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. That's those boys' father. Now, I want you to think about something that's brought out here that doesn't connect directly with what I'm trying to show here. How do you glorify God? Do what He said, and the way He said it, and for the reason He said it. How is God sanctified in the minds of the people? That is set about to be what God is and not just some run-of-the-mill something. How was he sanctified in those days, set apart from the idols, the false gods? It's when they did what God said, for the reason he said for them to do it, and the way he said for them to do it. That's how you know you have fully complied with any commandment God lays upon you. is an obligation that you must discharge to be pleasing to him. Moses called Mashael. And Elzaphan, the sons of Uziel, the uncle of Aaron, and said unto them, Come near, carry your brethren from before the sanctuary out of the camp. So they went near and carried them in their coats out of the camp. And Moses said, as Moses said, And Moses said unto Aaron, and to Eleazar, their brother, and unto Ithmar, their other brother, Uncover not your heads, neither rend your clothes, lest ye die. Now, you know, you almost say, what is there you don't understand about that? Well, I don't think, I don't. Does it change anything about what he said and the plainness and boldness of it regardless of what you think? Now, what did the man say? Uncover not your heads, neither end your clothes, which was the typical way they showed sorrow and grief, lest you die. But he adds to it, unless wrath come upon all the people. But let your brethren, the whole house of Israel, bewail the burning which the Lord hath kindled. And ye shall not go out from the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. For the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. And they did according to the word of Moses. They did what God said, and the way he said it, and for the reason he said it. Now what was the motivation? Lest ye die. What was further motivation? Lest everybody is punished. I want to make something very clear here, and it's not known enough nor practiced enough among the Lord's people. When you privately, personally, wherever it is, when you commit sin, you hurt the whole church. Well, I just don't I don't care what you don't see. It's because you don't see it that we're in the mess we're in. And it doesn't make any difference where anybody ever sees it or not. It still says it in the Word of God and anybody can read it and understand it that really wants to. So to allow sin to stay in the camp hurts me. I don't like to be hurt by my brethren's stupidity, sinfulness, and lack of respect for the authority of God. Now let me ask you this. Do you? Let's come down to the family, your own family. If your wife commits sin, husbands, that bother you? Does it hurt you? Does it hurt the immediate family? If your husband commits sin, does it bother the wife? Does it influence the wife? If there are children there, does it bother them? Now, if I can understand in my family, with my weak human powers, how much more so in the great family of the Almighty, who the Lord shed His blood to purchase, 
and to bring into this existence, to whom he adds every saved person to it. And when we got things like this in the Old Testament, and it's bold and it's plain, do we learn from it? Things morally right, but religiously wrong. We're guided by what the Bible instructs us to do, not by its silence. In the example of disobedience, there is the word of substitution. Substitution. You remember King Saul. He sought to substitute for what God had commanded in First Kings or First Samuel chapter fifteen. That is, God commanded one thing, and Saul decided he'd do something else, and God'd be happy with it. Kill everybody of the Amalekites and everything they've got. Saul says, well, we brought old King Agag here, and the best of the flocks we'll offer them to God, 1 Samuel 15, 12 through 28. And because he thought he was doing something for God, God ought to be happy with it. Now, that covers most people today, even some in the church. People are always talking about doing something for God. Have you ever heard that? Always. I'm doing something for God. Make a difference whether you say anything about it or not. If in my mind I do something for God, who cares about what he authorized? After all, that's kind of how we feel about everything. One cannot do anything for God that he's not appointed and have God's blessings on him. You can't do it. Or you can do it, but not have God's blessings on him. Saul did it, but it didn't have God's blessings. He was substituting ceremonies and sacrifices for what God had authorized. This was Saul's sin of disobedience. Substitution. Saul stands surely as a warning against substitution in the realm of religion today. Then there's the word presumption. And this form of disobedience is, I think, exemplified a pattern for us, a negative pattern. Don't do what he did in Uzzah. 2 Samuel 6, 3 through 9. Now the law prescribed particularly how to transport the ark. They didn't consult the law like they ought to when they were going to transport it. They put it on a cart. And of course they had a new cart. But, you know, that always allows you go get the Rolls Royce. Then the Lord said, walk, you get a Rolls Royce. He's bound to accept that. And they had these oxen and they got a couple of folks there to walk alongside to drive the oxen instead the cart. Like it is the ark. If it happened. And of course it did. He, the oxen stumbled and Uzzah put forth his hand to steady the ark, and God killed him. Wouldn't happen if they'd done what God said to do in transporting the ark in the way he said to do it, for the reason he said to do it, because the Levites were to transport the ark, and there were circles in the side uh, of the ark, and they were slide poles through it, and that's the authorized way of doing it. Now, what did God think when they just substituted the cart and uh, thought they'd transport it that way? It's not hard to figure out what he thinks. The fellow died. That tends to get people's attention. It also ought to tell us that he has to go that far to get those people's attention, that he means what he says, says what he means. I don't doubt that us his intentions were good, and we're not even dealing with the intentions of those people. But his act was one of presumption. And that presumption constituted disobedience. And no matter how well-intentioned us was his action, he was acting without authority. He was presuming on God. I want you to look what David prayed along this line. He was a part of all this stuff. In fact, it upset and got David all upset at first. And we go to the second uh, of the other account in Chronicles. You'll see that David realized we haven't followed the will of God on transporting the ark. He said, we made a breach. Uh, we transgressed God's will. We caused the death of this man as well as him being responsible for it. But listen to what David prayed in Psalm 19 and verse 13. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Strange view. Considerably different. And David had gone through one of those situations. And he knew the pain of being presumptuous when it came to doing God's will. Then there is the idea of deception. 
You remember the old prophet who lied to the young prophet, which young prophet was sent by God up to cry against the sins of Jeroboam in the northern kingdom. There was this old prophet Bethel. When he learned what the young prophet had done, then he followed him and he found him and he lied to him. And the young man died for believing a lie. 1 Kings 13, 11 through 19. 20 through 22. 23 through 24. Now, I know somebody's going to say, well, God punished the wrong man. He should have slain the old prophet if he's going to kill anybody in that deal. That comes from a mind that says, whatever God then did ends up all that God's going to do. Now, let me ask you something. What is time to God? Folks, I tell you today, unless the old prophet fully repented, he will be taken care of. When the time comes. But this was meant to be an example to everybody round about. That even a prophet of God must speak only as God said for him to speak. And then he must follow what God said do. But he didn't. So we need to learn a lesson on the danger of believing a line of disobedience to God through deception. In fact, Paul wrote to Christians saying as much. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 through 12, he's talking about what must transpire before there will be a second coming of Christ. And he says in verse 10 of 2 Corinthians 2, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, now listen, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned to believe not the truth, but had pleasure in righteousness. Now what's he saying? You know the way that is truth. Turn from that and you can't go but to any other, not other truth. You can't go but to anything but a lie. <laughs> let this aisle right here between here and those back doors or front doors as the case may be. Let that aisle represent truth. Now if you leave that aisle, what are you going to be involving yourself in? If that aisle is the truth and you leave that aisle, what are you leaving the truth for? It has to be a lie. So when you cease to love the truth, when you cease to be programmed by the truth, because you know the importance of the truth, and truth means more than you than anything else, the only place you can turn to is a lie. That's how God deceives them. He's not deceiving them in the sense of saying, well, I know you want to be saved, but I'm going to not let you. No. They made the choice. They left the way of truth. Now, if you turn from the truth, what do you turn to? But a lie. And that's exactly how we're deceived. And that's what happened to Eve. She knew what God said. She knew what was necessary to obey what God said. She could quote it back to the devil. But when she left it, she believed and obeyed the lie of Satan. And that's what happens to too many people. The same mistake then is made by a lot of folks today, even in the church. The last word, and it's yours, rebellion. Outright knowing it's God's will, but I'm going to do things my way. And that's Israel. Overall, the whole nation of Israel. The nation of Israel stands as a perpetual negative example of rebellion against God. That even God's people can say, we're going to do it our way. I know what's in the law of Moses, but I'm going to do it like I want to, and God will accept us. How else can you allow for people in Jerusalem when Nebuchadnezzar is besieging it for the last time. A lot of the people are already over in Babylon and Ezekiel there is doing the same work Jeremiah is doing. And yet they're still saying, well there's Jerusalem and there's the temple. God's not going to let it fall. When over and over again, countless times through the years, the prophet said, you're sinning, you must repent. It's because of the false concept that, well, I'm a Christian. Can anything happen to me? I was baptized into Christ. Now, I'm going to live however I want to live, but I was baptized into Christ for the of sins. I suggest this as we close the lesson on how one sins. That any sin those people in the Old Testament committed is one we can commit and do and we stand in danger of committing them. If not, how do you depart from the way of righteousness? How do you apostatize? How do you sin personally in your own life? 
It all depends upon your attitude toward God and your respect of Him, your love of Him, and also the things of God, the Word of God being one of those things. So as fundamentally the first principle that it is, I, I don't ever know a time the church is going to say, well, I, I heard that when I became a Christian. I don't need to hear that anymore. I don't believe that. When you look down through the stream of time in the Old Testament and how many times a prophet said over and over again in every generation the same thing, and it didn't head them off. People are that way. And we need to learn from that and teach and act accordingly. If you're not a child of God, you'll remember at the beginning of this lesson we taught you the plan of salvation. Now it's up to you whether you obey it or not. But God pleads with you to humble yourself and obey it. But as a child of God, have you committed any one of these sins under the authority of Christ? in violating the perfect law of liberty. If you have, you can repent of those sins, confess those sins, and pray God for forgiveness. I assure you, God, according to His will, will forgive you if you're honest of heart and repentant. So if you're subject to the great invitation of Christ, would you come to Him at this invitation while we stand and sing?